So when you are doing a sock of this sort, this plan, this recipe as I refer to them as, we start with um, casting on, if you're not already cast on, um, my procedure in this a demo will be then to add the river needles on my scrap yarn and then start with the sock yarn and the right position. So with this in mind, this is what the sock will look like. It will have a selvage, which is this edge at the top. I've overstretched the socks, so that's why it's a little bit uneven. Um, it is a one by one rib, which will then switch to the leg, which is a one by three rib. And then we'll work down to the heel, which is here. But in this point here, we do something called a pre-heel, which means there is no ribbing in that segment, just to kind of give it a better fit. It's just not as kind of clingy, I suppose. So then we continue down when we work this sock and you'll notice there's ribbing in my right hand, but not on the left. This is the bottom of the foot. There's no ribbing there for comfort. And here's a bit of ribbing on the top of the foot, which we go right down. Um, the pattern that I'm following that I created is one where just one row before the last row of the sock foot, I actually stop one row before and then I switch all the needles out so that it's much easier to close the toe and then we work the toe. So there you are there. So that's what it looks like in a basic overview. If you wanna see what this actual sock in my hand looks like, this is in my Ravelry under sock 49. So let's look at sock number one that I created earlier today. Um, I would have videoed with this one, but of course the app crashed. So here it is, the sock with my cast on bonnet attached still so this is what it will look like when it comes off the machine and then my scrap which i will then add the river and then there's my salvage which is only ever called that kind of beginning first row a special procedure or technique uh, that you follow that helps those stitches not unravel once you remove the scrap there's my one by one rib three by one and then i continue down of course to the heel, which is the Supri heel there, and then the heel, and then the foot, which is quite wonderful. And then in this scenario, as it just came off the machine, this is where, I don't know if you can fully see, that I've switched to the regular knit um, cylinder needles there, not the river, so this last row was easier to close. And then there's the, of course, open toe with some scrap um, so that you can Kitchener it close, as that's called. Now you'll notice I have two colors yarns here. This is acrylic sock weight scrap yarn, and this of course is doily number 10 kind of cotton. I use two styles because as much as I'm frugal, I don't like to waste things. So I always use the sock weight scrap when it touches the sock, and then I switch to a space saving, inexpensive, even more inexpensive kind of filler yarn. The idea here is I put this much between the toe and where my neck sock would have been, so I would continue, but I figured I should show you from scratch, not just from it loaded on the machine. All right, so let's start with this demo. Here we go. To start with this demo, we're gonna start with a new cast on bonnet, which is the thing that you use, whatever you choose to use, in order to start with the tension on your machine. Now, you can certainly use whatever works for you. You can use a net bag, you could use Gob's Web, it's called, when you just run a bunch of yarn and add some weight. You can use the antique start device, which looks like an un upside down kind of umbrella. There are so many things you can do. So whatever you do, you can use my universal cast on bonnet, which I have instructions on how to make yourself. You can also purchase some if you prefer not to make it yourself. Um, you pretty much have so many options. But so this is how you can do it. If you just wanna learn how to use the universal cast on bonnet, I have a video just for that. I have so many videos. Anyways, thanks for joining me today. Let's continue. So here we go. I'm going to um, add this now. Here we go. So this is the universal cast on bonnet. It has split rings on one side, although you certainly could put them on both sides. But how I've designed this basic one is I have the hung hem on the bottom and the split rings on top. 
Now, of course, whenever you're casting on with your machine, you only need to cast on with every second needle, not every single one, unless you are insane, glutton for punishment, that's okay if you are, but why? All right, so what I'm gonna do here is I'm just going to hang every second needle real quick. Don't need to use a needle tool unless you prefer. When you hang it, hang it ahead of the yarn car carrier. And of course, only hang it on the raised needles, not too close to the last of these raised ones here. So I'm just gonna pause here. These are up, but we're gonna pause. Whenever you have um, your yarn carrier engaged on your machine, engaged meaning it's right in the correct position, try not to crank unless there's yarn on the needles on the machine because you may not realize it, but just cranking without any weight without any yarn threaded, it may bash a slightly open latch and just kind of do that, do that in and it'll break and it'll bend and you won't even know it and then you'll be working away and it's, why is this one needle not behaving? Because you, you heard it earlier. So indeed, try not to do that. So I'm just gonna gently, you can see all the latches are down where I'm moving it. Just get your yarn carrier in position. Probably the only time you would move the yarn carrier without any weight on your machine. So now these ones, the rest of these have till here raised, so I'm gonna load them till here. Ensure that all your latches are open. Maybe one more, okay. Now we're gonna add our scrap yarn. So the scrap yarn I use is this acrylic sock weight from eBay. It's a huge cone, it might have cost me 30 Canadian, including shipping. So it is certainly a good weight to use and it's not too much of a difference on the machine. Now, most persons would just hold it to start, but I really like to use these 2.5 inch hemostats. They are locking kind of clips. They can be bought off eBay and Amazon, Hemostat. It's awesome. I work in a dental office. I did not get this from my dental office. I got it online, but yeah, I don't think they have them so small in the dental office. All right, so what I've done here is I've just kind of held the yarn scrap end so I don't have to hold it I don't have to think about it again so now what we're gonna do here is I'm gonna make sure all of the split rings are up not down into the bottom of the machine I'm just gonna grab the bottom of my bonnet you see that through the machine and add my buckle so the buckle itself is this is what it basically looks like it only moves one way you see that it's not flipping the other way so hold it with your eye to the sky, that's this hole here, eye to the sky, and you see that it only really opens the one way. So eye to the sky like this, and then put your yarn or your, your work through that. So I'm gonna go under the machine now, you're not gonna see it. I'll thread it through here, and then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn it backwards and add the weight to the eye. So that is just easiest to try yourself and you'll see how it works. When I first got my machine, I had no idea. Wow, it was very difficult, but once you get it, it's like child's play, I guess they say, right? All right, so it's there, and I'm gonna take my weight stack. I use a weight stem and two buckle, uh, two buckle weights, so it looks like a total of three pucks. It's three there, I promise. I have a cover on them. It prevents them from dancing off the stem and meeting my foot and the floor. Perfect, so you see that weight now is on the machine and the work is down. So we're just going to gently go forward. Now some people will choose to pull down and you can see that I'm holding it slightly with my left hand. Um, I don't subscribe to the idea of using your hand for only weight applying to the machine because you can't possibly have it always be a robot at the same tension pulling down. So if you add a weight, you're more guaranteed to always have the same, 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 which is what I choose to subscribe to. So now the rest of these needles are up so we are just going to do that. 
You may notice when you use a cast on bonnet like this or anything with split rings that wherever you've not hung or actually even with the net bag, wherever you've not actually added your bonnet, you might find the one that's not loaded when you work might flip up and over just because of the tension isn't there. Don't worry about it, rehang it, it's scrap, just like lift it up and cover it and just keep going. All right, so what I've done here is, whoop, there we go. So like my wraparound skirt, all of the bonnet is now hung. All of the needles have the equal tension all being pulled down to the middle. There we are, perfect. So now with this being ready, we can just simply go around. So you see how slow I did that? Super easy. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna add our ribber. I find you gotta at least do maybe the width of two fingers um, of your scrap from your bonnet before you can put your ribber on just to make sure that all your its and bits are connecting correctly. That's not an official word, of course. Um, all right, so we're looking at this. This is the ribber. And this part here connects to, where are you? This part right there, and it has to sit on this side. And on the bottom, you can't fully see with this view, is this adjuster here. So I will screw it one way and it'll come closer, screw it the other way and it'll go further away. All right, perfect. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna put this on the machine now with that river stop on the left side of the inner cylinder attached part. So when we look at this, this moves two different ways. So I'm gonna keep in mind where that fin was. I'm gonna connect it. Now inside it's touching the inside of that control or that attachment. I've marked with um, nail polish where uh, this should meet with my three o'clock. So it's easy for my eyeballs to see, but I can also feel it because it won't go any further this way. Now this part here, engage your tappet, which is what this part, is, this green part is. All right, perfect. So this goes this way. It's connecting with your drive pin. There we go. So the next step then is to Add the ribber needles. Now there's certainly a billion different ways to start with using your ribber. Um, one way, of course, is instead of loading all of these needles, you can load every second one. And then when it came to this part, you can just plunk them in and go to town. Um, the same alternative there is you could do every second needle and then catch with the ribber needle between and load and then go to town, there are so many things you could honestly do. But this is what I do because generally if I've done one sock, I do the next one and at that point all the needles would be in play. So this is what we do. So I'm gonna show you. So it's really important when you swap a cylinder to a ribber needle, um, you have to make sure the stitch doesn't go behind the latch of the ribber needle. Um, however, vice versa is not true. If you go from a ribber needle, it does not matter if the stitch goes below the latch because of course of how the, the motion of the machine, how it works. So we'll make sure that when we do this, which is what I call a handshake, we're gonna start at three o'clock. We always start at uh, three o'clock when we, when we add um, a ribber needle to the machine. So I am going to look here. So this needle that you see just after three o'clock is going to be placed on the stitch on a ribber needle here. And this one's going to be removed. And then we're basically going to do a one by one rib, which means every second one is now going to be a ribber needle and it's going to be in the ribber dial. So the important part here is not all machines align perfectly with this first point. So for me and how I set up my machine with my marking, excuse me, um, it'll either be the first needle or the second needle. You'll know what your machine is, but in this setup with my 72 cylinder 36 dial, this is the first at three o'clock. This is the best one to do. So we're gonna do that. To make this easier, you should consider putting your spring cylinder rest um, in use. So all I've done is just kind of release the pressure pushing down. So to do this, just grab your cylinder needle and make sure that that stitch stays in the latch, not behind, just like that, and the latch stays open. So we'll do a couple more. Here we go, so skip this friend, we'll go to this guy. Super easy. And you get better with time. The more you do it, 
try not to drop it, but if you do, your life's not over. You're not on sock yarn. Your life still wouldn't be over, but it does make it a little harder when you don't have a good foundation underneath holding your work. All right, so we're just going to continue here all the way around. Every second cylinder needle is now becoming a rubber needle. I will zoom out so we can kind of see a bit more. All right. So this video is being made in um, in parallel or in conjunction to the Ravelry entry I have known as socks at number 60, oh my goodness, 65. <laughs> um, and why I'm saying that is quite often in the past when I've seen a video, I found it often went too fast. And that be, me being a visual person, that didn't help because uh, watching the video, because I found it, I didn't know what the reference points were, why they're doing each step. And in some scenarios, it, it's just too far away. You can't see it. So what I chose to do here is to um, make this video and additionally provide the instructions I follow more often than not for cuff down socks in written form. So you can see that and maybe follow along with it. Whoops, which helps quite a bit. So you see there, perhaps that I've just dropped the needle, or rather the stitch, which is okay because it's still peeping there. So I'm just gonna grab it with my pick tool and add my rubber needle. Making sure the latch is open and everything is behaving. So this part, yeah, it's a bit tedious, but you get there you get there. So keep some firm um, connection with both needles when you swap between the where the stitch is and where you want it to go. Oops, see that went too far. I don't know if you can see that there. I will go back. So the trick with this is If it's behind the latch like it is, just kind of redo your handshake. It's on the left side of the latch. Go back and then it's loaded. You will see when you're actually managing the stitch what I mean. But yeah, that should help. This part's fairly straightforward. It's actually all pretty straightforward. Just um, kind of like getting directions to going to a location, one that you maybe haven't been before. You kind of know need to know where your next turns are. All right, so let's go at it here. I'm just rotating the crank wheel, bringing the spring rest, which is lifting the tension of that spring off the needles. Makes for easier needle manipulation. So whenever using a rubber, it's important you do some kind of special beginning. The reason why, and it's called a selvage, the reason why we do that is if you just started knitting and then took the scrap off the machine when you were done, it would undo. You need something that kind of locks it in. 
And that's like I said, something different than hand knitting. Um, there are many different formulas and methods of doing what that selvage is referred to as. The method I'm doing uh, is one that I found works for me, uh, where we have the ribber in play, and we're working with the ribber, and we do one complete row, and then two rows of knitting, and then just continue working on your ribbing. Just by doing that slight difference, it allows it to kind of lock in that first row, it doesn't undo. The one trick with the ribber um, that maybe you don't know about is if you turn it on or activate the ribber itself, once it's in play, um, it actually takes about four ribber needles of work before it's on or off. So let's just say right now I turned off the top and I took the switch out of work and then I kept cranking, it takes four river needles um, for it to go around the cylinder before it stops doing or starts doing what you're asking it to do. So why that matters is when it comes to doing some of the salvages, they're, they're precise. They want you to do one complete row. So what that really means is one row minus four river needles. So at the point, four river needles before your start point, yeah, turn off or turn on the river. That is something no one told me. I figured it out. That's okay. The other thing that's very important is always starting from the same parts, same spots that work for you. What works for me may not work for you. There's nothing wrong with that. Just your way, my way, hey, our way. Do what works for you. There's no right way, no wrong way. The wrong way, of course, is when you drop all your stitches and oh my goodness, you need to have a coffee break. All right, so there we are. All our ribber needles are now added to our scrap. So I like to just make sure that all this cylinder needles, all the needles are open, they all appear to be. Let's test that. Now you may look at this and say, well, wait a minute, these are closed, if you can zoom in and see that. That is okay, because when we made the round there, when we cranked ahead, it made the stitch and it did what it's supposed to. So there we go, we're just gonna go around. I like to do at least two rows, make sure everything is happy. Everything is happy. All right, so this is our six o'clock position for further reference from that initial view. Um, and this is our three o'clock position. Pretty much a lot happens here. Uh, whenever we do any kind of uh, raising or lowering of the back needles to do a toe or a heel, that's done when this uh, yarn carrier is at six. So the next step, of course, is to begin with our sock yarn. And we begin with our sock yarn at this position here. This will be the first needle of my sock yarn. So the trick here is to start by swapping the yarn. So work to this point and then cutting my scrap and just, it doesn't matter what kind of knot you do. I do a square knot, granny knot, whatever you call it. And then what we want to do is we want to fish the yarn into that spot here, hang on to it from underneath, and then just begin with the sock yarn. So what I like to use, um, I like to use a variety of things. I mean, I believe in giving everything third and fourth chance if I, you know, whatever, get the chance and opportunity to. Uh, one way to do this is some people don't have the river on and then they do all these steps. Hey, that's your, your call. This is just how I do it. Um, I've more reliably started this point here with one of these kind of elastic tools that for waistband threading of elastic in your pants. Um, you know, it's just a very long latch. And you're just going to take it inside and come up that tiny little slot. It's actually much easier than you think. But what we'll first do is let's Go ahead and stop just before that mark so that that last needle is down before the red. Let's turn some light onto this. It's kind of hard to see. Bah. All right, so there you can see here the last one down before the red. This will be our first river needle of the new. So at this point, we're gonna use our scissors and just cut the scrap. I like to cut just above the machine at this point, um, just because, you know, I don't want to waste the yarn, even if it's scrap, I don't want to waste. All right, 
So now you're going to take your sock yarn, feed it up through your carrier. Or not your carrier, sorry, your yarn topper. Words. What are those? Let's turn on some more lights. There we go. All right, so I'm going to take Granny and have a little knot. Bada bing, bada boom. There we go. Not too big of tails, so nothing gets in the way. And so as I said, now we want to fish that inside the machine. And so we're going to use our little latch. Just kind of push it up along the inside wall of the machine. Excuse me. <sighs> and aim for that spot. Oh, you can see that's the latch there. And do maneuver until you can kind of just grab. There we are. And just gently bring it down inside the machine. Make sure that knot you tied was sufficient that it doesn't undo here. Not life and death, but not awesome. So I'm going to continue with some downward pressure. And then have that knit that first stitch. Make sure that that first stitch that you've just added, the new sock yarn, is in position and where it will knit, not behind the latch. That's a common oopsie. All right, so going forward, anytime we begin a step, we should know what the next step will be so we're prepared for it. So the next step, we are doing our salvage, we'll go all the way around. And what I like to do is I like to knit that last stitch that I started with before I turn it out of, uh, take it out of work, which isn't, the full rolls or the information but that's how I do it so here we go I'm gonna go all the way around with the scrap yarn or sorry with the sock yarn in play that's ribbing one row right to the needle uh, right to the needle before the one I worked on and now we're gonna take tap it out of work so now it's out of work leave everything as it is and do two rows and I mentioned those four needles River needles are going to continue going because it takes four of them to decide what we're doing before we do it. So there they are. Now we no longer have a river in play. It's one row. And there's two. Pretty much that same needle again knitted. And now we'll put it back into play. And then you want to reset your counter, which is just out of view there, to zero. So our pattern for today is one that does 20 rows of one by one ribbing. We're at zero. We are ready to start. So here we go. I like to make sure that things are doing what they're supposed to do. So just watch. Either you choose to go slow-mo all the way or what. But I find going like a speed demon is not a good idea because often things hiccup. All right. So we're going to 20 on our counter. I'm going slow because I prefer to go this speed machine will tell you when it's getting upset. You can feel it sometimes. Sometimes you can hear it. Latches you might have bumped. Misbehave. Not in this scenario. Shouldn't jinx myself. All right, here we go. Coming up to 20 rows. Now our next step um, will be that we stop with the uh, cylinder rest at three o'clock. So that's our next step. So I'm watching the counter and watching the alignment of what the next step will be. One more row. I'm stopping with that there. So it's at 20 rows. Now we're gonna do our needle change. With our needle change, we are going to make it now a one by three. It's currently a one by two. This will make more sense in a minute. So what we're about to do then is we're about to go Oops. From here to the one by three. All right, so let's do that. So because I have a 72 cylinder and a 36 here, what that maths out to is every second river needs to become a cylinder. So I'll just give that a visual so it's easy to see. Maybe not totally without being zoomed in. 
All right, so all we're gonna do here is just gonna do a needle swap. We just did the reverse before we started the cuff, so it's pretty straightforward. Does not matter where the stitch sits with the cylinder needles because of the way it knits. So every second one is now become, every second rubber dial 36 uh, slot dial is becoming a cylinder needle. And this makes more sense when you can actually see the results. So when you flip that, you can see here we have one rubber needle, one, two, three cylinders, one rubber needle, one, two, three, one rubber needle, one, two, three. And repeat that all the way around. So when we are actually working on the, the sock, the rows we count aren't the rows with the um, needle exchanges or changes. They are the rows that, where those needle changes have happened already. So if the next part of the pattern, which says I would like to have 60 rows for the leg, that's the area between your ankle and your cuff, then I wouldn't count this needle exchange row as a row. Hope that makes sense. All right, so there. All right, so work your way around. We're not counting the row. As long as you always do it the same, it should be fine. All right, bring my yarn uh, spring rest around. So on this side, we are doing every second one. Bada bing. Here we go. I'm not super fast at this. I'm okay with that. I'd rather go slow and ensure I didn't drop anything than Speed Demon. Good. Oh, see, I missed this one here. Machine's hiding. That's okay because we haven't ribbed with it yet. But the spring is now down, so I'll raise it. There we go. Perfect. So one, two, three, one, two, three. Kind of like we're dancing. Okay. Make sure the cylinder needles are all open and the rubber needles are doing what they're supposed to. I'm actually doing this video on sock number two, obviously, because I showed you the sock before the video started. Um, I had videoed, but the app crashed or something. And please forgive the infrequent parents of our two cats. Java black and white, Polly white is black. They uh, wander all over the place. They will sometimes come by and bump things. They are sweet. Both are adopted cats. They needed home. So we found one for them, us. All right, so continue all the way around. Alrighty. So we are done all the way around. So let's proceed to our start point. Now we, our next segment is to do the legs, which in the one by three rib. And that is a total of 50 rows. When we look at that instruction, we also make sure where our next turn is, kind of like we're driving somewhere. If you need to turn left and you're in the far right lane, ain't gonna help you at all. So let's continue down here. So when we finish the leg, we need to stop the yarn carrier at 12. So let's do that. All right, so we need to do 50 rows and then stop at 12.
He's doing the leg of the sock. So we stopped at 12. So the next part of the sock is to do something called the preheel. The preheel again is the part just after the leg, this part here, where we need to take the rubber needles out and then work 10 rows. So let's do that. We're going to take out the rubber needles um, on this side of the halfway marks. So we're going to take all of these out. Um, the extra thing that we're going to do in this pattern is we want to make sure in this pattern that every second needle, or so rather, if there is a river needle between the first and second slots after the halfway, then we swap it as well. So this side we don't have to worry about because they're both, there's just three um, cylinder needles after the halfway point. You see that there? One, two, three, doesn't count. But on the other side of the sock, that you can't see, of course. Um, <laughs> there is a river needle within one or two positions after the halfway. So for this pattern, we wanna make sure anything that fits that scenario needs to be swapped to a cylinder needle. All right, so we have all those ready. I pulled them out just for visual clue. I don't usually do that, but it might help you see that, that I'm doing this here on the machine. So just for the sake, I'm going to make it easier by lifting my cylinder spring, cylinder spring, I can't speak. I'm gonna set my counter back at zero. And now we're going to transfer those stitches. So again, it does not matter when we go from rubber to cylinder as much as the reverse. So we can just simply transfer. Doesn't matter where the stitch is as long as it's gonna knit when it works. And let's do the same with all of these. All right, just swapping out our friends here. Okay, and we're gonna, so these are all now gone. And then on this side, as I said, you can see there is one river needle between the first and second after the half. So this one goes as well. There we are. It has to do with the pattern that we're gonna follow is going to create a interlocking stitch, which will be placed just on the heel at this point here so that the hole is tiny, not big. There we go. Let's finish swapping needles out to what they should be. Make sure all your latches are open. Cannot say that enough. Excuse me. Bada bing. Come on, little needle. So while this video is playing for this length of time, do know that I am going this speed for this video. It doesn't normally take this long to do this. Once we do the swap, we'll do the 10 rows. There we go. And always check that your latches are open. Yes, sir. Put the spring back into work. Holds everything in place. All right, so this step now is to do the pre heel where we work 10 rows and we're going to stop the yarn carrier at six. So let's do that. 10 rows. 10? Oh, I guess they're 10. Hi, Java. Just wanted to check that I also did 10 there, too. Yep, I did. Okay. So now at this point, um, we would do the heel. Uh, however, I like to add one more step to this. Um, in case something has dropped, I can now fix it. And it just I like to see the heel being made and make sure nothing drops and misbehaves. Now you certainly could leave the river in play 
I would rather leave it on the machine. But what I like to do is I like to do something I refer to as river parking. And then I do an extra step beyond that. So at this point, if you were creating the heel with the river still on the machine, it's very important that at that point you would take the drive pin out, so you're parking it here, and then you would make it out of work so nothing would move. It would stay right there while you're making the heel here. The important reason why it's staying here on this side of the machine is because I have found that if you um, let the drive pin stay, it's going to push it here and start pushing the needles in and out, which won't give you any clearance for the yarn carrier as it goes by. So if you are not taking the rubber off the machine at this point, make sure you do this. If you're leaving it on the machine, out of work, out of work, and take the driver, uh, drive pin out. I am gonna take it off the machine, so I'm gonna follow this, okay? So I'm gonna keep it in work, and I'm gonna leave this as is, okay? Just note that stipulation, huge difference. So, I'm gonna proceed now from this point as the river parking that I'm going to be doing. Not the tappet parking that I showed you with it staying there if you're leaving it on, but taking the river off the machine. So with that, what we're gonna start with is taking all the river needles and leaving them on the needle, just park them upside down in their cylinder slots. Just poke them into that cylinder screw. No, spring, cylinder spring. The words, you know what I mean. And it's gonna actually stay, it kinda of clicks into place. Oh, my nose is itchy. All right, it's super easy. Okay, now see, I dropped a stitch there. You can't see it because the yarn's in the way. I'm just gonna put the river stitch or river on the side. That's okay. Kinda didn't wanna drop anything, but I'm kinda glad I did so I can show you how to fix it. So I can see now that any of the river needles I had in play are actually upside down. And that means nothing's gonna lock it to the machine. So let's have a look. I'm gonna take the river and just put it aside. And now we look at it. That's in the way. Oh, look at that. So we've dropped uh, a row here and we've dropped something going on there. Super easy to fix, okay? So first of all, what we're going to do is, uh, let's see here. What I like to do is I like to continue with the setup. So at this point, before I fix anything, I want to do the next step of the river needle parking that I do. I like to just, because there's a nub here, if you just leave them upside down, it will sometimes hit, most often, hit the yarn carrier. So what I do here is I just flip it out of the spring and just let it sit on the inside. Now you're gonna say, oh my goodness, those are still quite wide out to the machine. I'm not done with them yet, one sec. Come on, little spring, let you go. So I'm just gonna scooch them down so they just kinda have a little rest inside. And let's do that over here too. I had a wonderful individual show me a November uh, 219 Lacey Washington CSM event um, that if you want to do needle manipulation or any kind of work manipulation while it's on the machine, to put an elastic on your needles. Oh my gosh! Why didn't any of us think of that before? Unfortunately, I don't remember the guy's name, and I've only seen him twice in the last year and a half since I've been in this community. So I apologize if I don't know your name. Um, you only stayed one night on each event that I saw you at, and you worked your machine very ferociously. All right, so here we go. What we're gonna do now is we're just going to, I guess we could raise them too. Yeah, let's raise them too. Okay, so part of the pattern of doing the sock, um, even if we had the river in on the machine, is to raise the needles. So normally a regular pattern would just raise every needle from behind the halfway mark. But because I'm doing an interlock switch, I need to raise them from the second. So we're gonna raise the needles from the second position behind each halfway. One, two, there we are. So what does that look like close up? Let's look. So not this one, but this second one on both sides, okay? So this one is down and this one is up. All right, there we go. So now that those are up, 
what I can do is what I prefer to do is continue finishing the sock on the foot of the, the foot of the sock. Blah, blah, blah. So we always stop at 12. All right. So I need to fix this one and I need to fix that one. So first thing I'm going to do is just any manipulation. Let's put the elastic on the machine. And let's take the weight off because why are you pulling against yourself? I mean, that's just more work than anybody needs. All right, and I'll even take the buckle off because that's a little extra weight. Okay, so we've applied our elastic just to help lock the stitches onto the needles. We've removed the weights. There's no weight at all, no buckle, nothing underneath. This looks like a, a dropped river stitch and this is a dropped, maybe just a cylinder there. So we're gonna do this one first, it's so much easier since it's very short. Um, how you latch up or correct a, I guess on the inside, a purled stitch is different than how you'd latch up a knit stitch. So this is in the inner part of the machine, so it's how we look at it, this part. So what that means is when I look here, you know that this is a knit stitch and these bumps are purl stitches. That's all I'm saying. So that when we need to fix this one, I actually latch them up from the top going, from the latch being upside down, so latch facing down. And if I'm latch fixing the knit stitch, I do the latch facing up. It'll make more sense in a minute, but here we go. So we can see there, there's that little trader just sitting there, ready to be undone. The reason why we take the weight off is so that you can easily fix this. So the first thing you need to do is undo the stitches that knitted on top so that we can go all the way down to it. So locate which needle that it that is. It looks like it's, yeah, it's this one here. So all you do is just take it off the, the needle and then undo it. There we go, so I have a bunch of ladders ahead. And then we want to latch that little guy up. So when I said about, this is purl stitches here, because we're working on the inside, all we do, I hope my big fat hand doesn't get in the way. I come from all of them, because it's fairly short. And I have the latch, so first thing I do is then I take my pick tool and I am going to, oh, I should have my longer latch. There we go. I hit my pick tool and stop that last loop from dropping further. And I'm gonna take my latch hook and just kind of trap it. So you can see that there. So this is the last trapped stitch. It won't go any further. Uh, let's see here. You know what, it looks like this is knitted stitch and then to the to that one. So uh, let's rewind what we're doing here. So we're just gonna take the latch off. We need to come from the other way. So we need to do maybe three of those per, uh, knit stitches. To do that, we do it from the bottom up. So there we go. It'll make more sense in a minute. All right, so we need to do like three. So to do that, we put the next bar in line there and we just knit it, there we go. And confirm that by having it look at the stitch and make sure that's correct. So previous stitches behind the latch, the bar that you want above it, just like that. So we need to do this for a couple more, two more. So previous behind the latch, it's like it's knitting on the machine. Then one more. That way it'll look just like it should. Previous behind the latch, next bar on it. There we are, done. So now we've finished the same level. It all looks the same there, perfect. Now I'm gonna just trap that live, live loop and then do what I was doing initially and I misread that it was just one style of stitch. So we're just going to do this. This is stitch theory, a stitch a surgery. <laughs> All right, so 
Now that we are doing the pearl part, as you can see the latch hook is now upside down, not right side up. And what we're gonna do here is we want the previous still to be behind the latch. That's the trick to it. And then the bar we want in line, the next in line. It's a little finicky. Beat starting over. We are just gonna put it there. There we are. So it's ready to knit. So now it's gonna make that pearl. Make sure it, there we are, perfect, works. So again, previous stitch is behind the latch. Next bar is ready to knit. There you go. And this may look so complex, but I promise you do it. You get so good at it. There you go. why I prefer a smaller latch hook like this is pretty nice um like if you were like rug hooking doing that craft and you were using that latch hook I find it's too big it's huge and it'll just be painful a lot of work all right almost done You won't even know that you dropped it. Uh, now, initially, when I drop stitches, I would just fix it at the end. But when you manually do them, they're no longer as um, tension even. So it's actually very obvious when you hand latch. So doing it this for a couple is worth its weight in gold. So I'm gonna just load that now under the elastic. Perfect, now it's locked into place. So what exactly is the purpose of this elastic? Look at this, I can't accidentally lift it off. If I was manipulating that and it wasn't on, little guy would be undone, unhappy, and just, you know, whatever. So the next point is to do the other part, which is this part here. So let's just zoom out so we know what we're doing. Perfection, beautiful. Now we need to fix this. So we can easily fix these. These are all up, so nothing's gonna drop. That's why we're not worrying about elastic on them. But now I'm just gonna kinda zoom in. What we're gonna do is we wanna protect the hooks from our knitted stuff. As you know, if I just took a sock and just kinda laid it over here, it would probably catch and just pull stuff, and that's not pleasant. So let me just zoom out. So what we're gonna do is just take a bag that you have, anything that's not knitted, at one point I was just using a Kleenex, but it was clean Kleenex, don't worry. So what I'm doing here is I'm just protecting the needles from catching my work. I have no weight on the knitting material. And now look, I can easily pull through and look at what happened before. Oh, naughty. So you can see here, it dropped right here. What is this? After the, the pre-heel, it dropped. And then it caught and then it dropped Ooh, buzzard wing so good news is I don't have to undo all that's undone just the part that accidentally knitted between if that makes any sense all right so what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna just zoom in it's actually not that hard I find I'm um, doing this much easier so what we're gonna do is we're gonna undo the part that actually caught in the middle so gently undo those stitches any other way is just to kind of that some of the yarns have like a bit of small hairs or fibers that kind of lock them in like mohair so it's not super runny that's a word okay all right so as you can see they're all and there's my active loopy loop perfect so um we are so the we, are, we made the sock going this way up. So what we're gonna do here is simply lose, use our latch hook. You'll see which, which way to put it, to orient it in order to get the stitch you want. But this is easy. So make sure it's not twisted. There we are. With the previous um, stitch under the latch or behind the latch, closest to you, grab the next bar and there you are. Now repeat. I find this much easier than upside down and, oh my goodness. So 
So also, if you use a monster uh, latch hook here, it would change the tension a lot. Some of it will wash out and even any major tension differences, if they're not major, any mi minor tension differences will wash out in the laundry. Buzzard dropped it. Make sure you don't split the yarn like I just did. Yeah, okay. Oop. Now, um, some people have complained about how small the needles are and how much the work is so tiny. I've set up a second lamp for when I feel I need a boost to kind of look at things more clear uh, with a magnifying in it. So the Bright Tech lamp that we use, um, I've got a second one and I left the lens in it where the one that I'm working over the machine has no lens in it and the light's just right over the machine. And I'll include a link to that too. I got it off Amazon in the States. So as you can see, super easy. So we'll just continue down until we're back to where we should be. So it's good that we can take it off the machine for this. This purpose allows you to fix something instead of getting a surprise later. That and the, as I said, the work is, you can't even tell that it had come off. This yarn is gorgeous. So the tool I'm using at the moment is a latch tool that I made. It's just a cylinder needle that had broken the butt off. And I just stuck it in a piece of wood for a handle. I'm waiting for my Dave Lord tools to come. I find that preferences kind of vary. You'll choose to like something and then you maybe choose that you don't like it. Don't get rid of it. You might change your mind again later. pretty fast and I'm slow on the video you should see me regularly I don't often drop stitches but this gives you that you know fail safe that if you do you, you're not gonna worry about it which is wonderful I only dropped the two one was more sneaky than the other of course a drop stitch can happen anytime you're not paying attention can happen when a latch closed. Um, if you accidentally magnetize your needles and they misbehave, all kinds of things. So if I had left the river on, I would have continued on to the end of my sock, would have taken it off the machine and then found those two areas. Now that is my preference that I do this, certainly, but uh, it's so wonderful. Alrighty, there we go. Behave. There we go, it's ready. And because of course it's locked in, nothing fell, nothing dropped. So now what we're gonna do is stick it back where it should go. I'm gonna take the elastic off because I don't need it. Now we are going to start with the heel like we didn't have any drop stitches. So at this point, don't forget to put your heel spring on. That's that thing above. And make sure you put your buckle and your buckle weights on because you should never move the crank unless you have weight on. Alrighty, okay so what we're gonna do here is we're also gonna add the heel fork, um, heel weight. I have a Shamboard CSM sweet spot heel 
which is just a uh, heel fork and weight. Um, this is just a wonderful improved version of the antique one, which was a tiny V, maybe half the length. Um, so there you are. It's very cool. Uh, these heel marks that I pointed out perhaps before, you actually hang this on the inside with right about there. They are your guide. Mine are a bit wide. I keep trying to narrow them. There we are. So when I hang them, I'm going to hang them on the inside of the machine onto the knitting using those as guides. So let's do that now. If you hang them too close to the top, they don't do anything. They do a little bit, but not as much as they could. So I've got that hung there. You see those approximately. And now I've added that weight, that weight here that they provide with it. Painted it my favorite color. Thank you. Perfect. All right, so reviewing here, the pattern that we're using is one where we've um, not done the usual right behind the halfway marks all up. We've raised um, these to the second needle behind the half marks for that interlock stitch that happens on both sides of the feet, left and right or right and left, whichever way is what. Now we're gonna start with our sock. So in order to make this easy for you, I always start the same way. Um, and maybe it's easy for you too. So whenever I start a new row, I start where I am now. So at 12 o'clock, you're always gonna start the heel and the toe on the right-hand side of the machine. It's just a rule. You'll see it. If you're on the left, you boobered. You might need to fix it. Um, it's not that impossible to unknit. There's a video I left. So what we're gonna do is for each step that we do from now on, heel and toe, we're going to start at 12 and then raise. Do our action and then move. Start at 12, do our action and then move. All right, so let's do that. So our instructions in the pattern say lift two. This is our first uh, movement with the heel on the right. The reason why we do this again, this is for the interlock stitch. So we won't raise two ever again in the same fashion. Two on the right. There we are, everything's good. All latches are open. Doesn't hurt to make sure. Make sure you're not caught in anything. Good, here we go. Now we're gonna raise two on the left. That's our other interlock stitch and zoom on over, bada bing, beautiful. All right, from now on, we're gonna only raise one. We're gonna raise one at a time until we finished our decrease and we're at our heel marks. So just before our heel marks. All right, so now, oh my goodness, where was I? Um, I'm obviously on the right, but did I raise that needle or not? Easy way to tell is look really close. As long as you remember you're on the increase or the decrease, and you can pull back that last needle. See how it's been knitted? I know I need to raise it. If it, um, it's important at this point that it's raised. It'll make more sense as you go, the more you do it, whether or not something should be up or down if you've gotten out of your sequence. But I see here that I didn't raise it yet because that last worked one isn't raised. So there we are, we're gonna raise it. This point will make more sense as you go. So don't worry if that was just like speaking another language you've never heard. So we raise the needle as our first action and then we move. Raise the needle, first action, and then we move. Make sure your knitting stays flush against the machine which is why we have all these weights. Then we move. Then we move. I like to put my hand on the, um, the weight of the heel fork. I'm not pushing, I'm just kind of holding. I guess it's just to get a sensation of something is misbehaving. So it doesn't matter what cylinder you're using with this, you can do this with any cylinder. Because you're the number of movements would depend, of course, on how many stitches you have in your machine. But the method's the same. Okay, so now that we're there, we're at 12, we've raised, now we move. Just keep your rhythm up. 12, raise, move. 12, raise, move. If you're confused at this point, don't worry. Follow the instructions in the pattern. 
they basically say just do one on each side and I and just step by step just keep going we know what our next step is we've looked at it we're familiar with it we're doing the heel we're on the right here we go we're on the left uh, maybe you didn't see that but I just caught it so this guy did not knit this last stitch hung onto it like it was its friend, but it didn't knit it. Naughty. So one way I can do it is I can just take this bottom stitch and just lift it up and over, but it actually makes it super tight that way. So what I like to do is if I can, it's not trapped inside the cam, I gently lift the cylinder spring and I'll make that stitch like it was supposed to. It tends to make an even tension all right, and it was down, so we put it down. Good. Make sure it's open. All right. Now we are still um, decreasing, and that one was the last knitted, and it's not up, so it needs to go up. And now we're going to go across. So let's zoom back out. There we go. Ensure that your work doesn't rise. I don't know if you can see this, but it's starting to rise. So a quick way to fix that is just take your finger and push it over. There you are, it did. Perfect. We're on this side. This one's last knitted. Raise up, go across. Same happen, excuse me, on the left. There we go. Now, if you can see that, we have just gone down each heel mark the last. We're done on both sides right now. As we're at our target. Our target is that we've raised all the needles to the mark. And we're on the left because we just raised that needle. Now we're gonna work to the right. Here we go. Raised it, move. Great. So, this is what it should look like. This is what it should look like before we do the increases. And this is what it should look like. Our next step now, we are on the right. We finished all of our decreases. When they're up, they're out of work. And now we're gonna start our increases. For the heel, we start, we're on the right. We're at 12, we do our movement, and then we move. So our, we do our needle move, and then we move. So we're on the right, we're at 12. First thing we do is we just lower. We're gonna do what's called a no wrap, I believe. And you'll see that that previous yarn is under the latch. Make sure it stays open like that. As we come back now, as we crank, this yarn is gonna go in and make a stitch. Um, the old way, the other way of one making a heel or a toe is to kind of redirect the yarn and then crank. But as you can see, we're not. We're just lowering the needle. So it's gonna go around that latch. So let's slowly do that so you can see. I like to raise up the, the heel fork at this point so it's closer busy doing some work for us. All right, so we're just gonna go slow. You can't see that now, of course. But there we go. And then it made that wonderful stitch. So now what we're gonna do, the pattern says, is we are gonna continue. We are going to, con oh, buzzer wing. There we go. We are continuing to make our we're gonna continue making our heel here on the increase side. So now we're on the left, we're at 12, do the movement, there we go, lower the needle. We're not pushing all the way down. If we push all the way down, then you're gonna note that stitch closes. See how that closed? Don't want that. So we're just gonna be proud, as I was told once. So you can be, there's a sweet spot, like there. So that is up. And that is down, and that is proud. 
down for enough, farther enough that the needle will catch and it'll come down, but not so far as to close it accidentally. And we're just going to come through now. So we move to we crank. Just wanted you to see that. See how it goes around? Beautiful. All right, so we're gonna zoom back out so you can see the whole thing. So we're just gonna continue doing that until we are back to our halfway point. All right, so now we're on the right. We're at 12, move the needle, crank. We're at 12, move the needle, crank. I find personally that if you drop a stitch during the increase or decrease parts, start over. Or at least back it up until you can fix it. Because if you are trying to correct stitches that um, are all twisted and whatever, just by their design, it's too hard. Unless you are better at that than me, then hey, power to you. So we just continue on each side. We're at 12, push the needle, crank. 12, push the needle, crank. The other reason why we're going to 12 is the machine locks the needles right in front of where they knit. And by moving it out of the way, any movements we can do ahead of time. So that's why. All right. side, right side, all right so the right needle before the hash is down, we're going to go to the left now, left needle before the hash is down, now we're going to stop at six, perfect, so at this point we are done the heel. It looks fantastic, well done. We actually haven't finished yet because it needs to go to here, but if we went over here without lowering these, they would be locked to have problems. So we're gonna leave the machine where it is right now, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna put the river back on. So to do that, we do things in reverse. So let's take the resting needles, the resting rubber needles, and pop them back into the cylinder slots and click them into the, the spring that's sitting there. This will give us the clearance to put the ribber back in the machine. All right, bada bing, bada bing. And again, of course, you could have done your sock with the ribber always on it. You can follow these instructions and not use the ribber at all and just skip through the ribber parts. Why not? This can be a sock without a ribber. What would you do instead? Well, instead of using the river to begin, you could have done a hung hem. Hung hem is simply cranking, let's say, 20 rows and hanging the beginning part on the row that you're at. That would give you a hem of 10 rows on the outside where it's attached. Pretty easy. And then it would be finished. It'd be fine. All right, anyways, so we're ready now to put the river back on. There's nothing in the way. Perfect. We're at 6 o'clock, which is almost the seven I usually add the river but close enough so again uh, we're gonna watch that part here the river stop and we want to make sure it connects to the, where it connects to in the machine so here we go I've made sure that my tap it plate which is this thing here make sure it's in work meaning that it's towards the inside of the machine. Make sure your drive pin is in place. It pushes the timing lever, the timing screw, and it puts it at the right distance so that it does the right stitches. Okay, good. So now we're aligned up. So now we're going to lower the back needles while we're at six still. Perfect. Alrighty. And now we want to make sure, is we want to make sure that we put these parked river needles back in the slot that they should correspond to. So this is something you can't see from far away. 
reviewing again that this after the halfway is usually our first river needle in the past and won't be now, but that's fine. We, this one will be the one that we we have there. So that's, that's how it works out. When you look at your pattern, if you've got everything set up as I do, um, in regards to alignment of the machine and using that first and then using the one by three, that's where it lines up. Don't worry if yours isn't, as long as you're following the regulations of the pattern instructions. So in any case, let's start here. This is our upside down river needle. What we're gonna do is we're going to unpark them. So I do that first. I unpark them. So unclip them from their spring. Just click them up. Stitch is still being held. It's doing its work. Some of them you're not gonna have full access to until you go around. All right, so now that that's ready, you can kind of just lock it back and then you can even just kind of cheat and stick the legs in there. The butts, butts. Okay, uh, once again, when you are going from a cylinder to river, it's more important than the reverse where the stitch is. On a river needle, you wanna make sure that that stitch doesn't stay behind the latch. So we're going to handshake it into place and put it in the machine. Make sure you are at the right corresponding slot once you put it back in the machine. It's not hard, but it means being aware. So there we go. So the stitches are not behind the latch. If you want just a video on the handshake or the transfer of the needles, I do have one on my channel. I'll try to quote it down below. Okay, a few more. So this next step then, since that was the heel, is to do the foot. And the foot itself is going to be, where is that? I always follow my instructions, even if I know what it says. So our foot is gonna be 60 rows and we're gonna stop at six o'clock. But with this pattern, we're gonna stop at 59 rows and stop at six o'clock. All right, so knowing that, we set our counter to zero at this point before we move anything. Now, nothing's in the way back here, but they're not in place correctly yet. They're not back in the rubber dial. So I'm just gonna give myself some space, making sure all the needles are open. The um, heel weight and V fork are still engaged because there's longer fabric on this side of the machine. If I took it off and started cranking, there wouldn't be tension on that fabric and it would just drop stitches. So leave everything underneath as it should be, okay? We're just gonna slowly go forward so that we can see now, oh, there they are, um, and finish working on those needles there, making them sit back on the river so we can do the foot. All right. Beautiful. So all of our river needles are now back into work and the river's in work and everything is great. So if you had not removed your river, hey, we're gonna start here and keep going. If you had, this is where we are, let's keep going. Both of us keep going. All right, so I sound lame to myself too. All right, so now we're ready to do then that 50, no, sorry, 60 rows minus one row. All right, so let's do that. So let's do the prescribed foot is 60 rows. So we're actually gonna do 59 rows, okay? Latches are open. I think I need some oil. Give 
some oil. How much your oil is up to you. All right. So again, we're back to knitting the foot. We're gonna do a total of 59 rows. And we're stopping at six o'clock. Why are we doing that? Oh, there we go. We stop a row before our ideal foot length because we want to switch the river needles for cylinder needles on that very last row. Because this will be the last row of knitting that we're about to do here before we close the toe. That'll make more sense in a minute. Um, so let's swap out these four cylinder needles. So for that, we are just gonna move the spring on hold and swap those last river needles for cylinder needles. The good news here by doing this is not only does it make kitchenering way easier to have all the same style uh, stitches on the edge, not purl and knit, but all knit. But it also makes it that the river comes off one last time and you can see if there's any boobers, any mistakes that you've done between the... We're going to do this last row so we can move it around. Um, if we've dropped any stitches on the foot, we can fix them one last time before we do the toe. No one has to know, although there's video proof. I won't tell if you don't. All right, there we go, beautiful. Bah humbug, there we are. <laughs> uh, a few more and then we're good. So we're working that last row. Beautiful. There we are, beautiful. Good. There we go. All right, so let's work our way back to six again. Great. Now there should be no rubber needles on the machine, so let's take that off. Beautiful. All right. Now you can see there, there's no mistakes, thank goodness. At this point, we could take the heel fork off, or the V-fork. We're gonna put it on in a minute, but I like to just make sure what we did is correct. If we're gonna get there, we may as well check. Get all the weight off and just have a look. Be careful without an elastic. Oop, there is a drop stitch. Haha, <laughs> I'm glad I looked. Let's put that elastic on and let's fix that drop stitch green elastic so you can see we're at six o'clock okay good so locking the stitches in place let's have a look what happened there ah it's a knot oh, maybe that'll be fine it's on the foot bah. great good we're looking at it there's your heel Good. Where's, ah, oh, there it is. So it did drop one of the rubber needles part way. Super easy to fix. So you just do the same thing as you did before. Undo here, and then we just latch all the way up. I'm gonna pause the video at this point, because you don't need to watch me do that another time. Here we go. 
Okay, so I fixed that drop stitch. Now we can put it all back together again like it never happened. We are at six o'clock. We're ready to start the heel. In order to start the heel, we're at six o'clock. We raise those back needles. So let's make sure we apply the weight as we should before we do anything on the machine. There we go. I'm just adding the buckle on the bottom. And then I'm gonna hang my weight. Heel spring might still be engaged. I often just leave mine on so it's engaged. At this point, to do the toe, we're gonna to do the regular raising of all the needles from exactly behind the halfway mark. You could use your finger to lift, but be careful they're sharp, or you can use your crescent tool. That's what this is called, a crescent tool. It's a nice little help. There we are, perfect. All right, easy, quick. Let's rehang using our guides, the heel fork, V-weight, whatever you wanna call it, and thereabouts there. So with this heel spring engaged and with the weights below, everything is where it's supposed to be, and there we are. We will finish our last to 12. Let's start at 12, there we go. All right, so first step you'll see in the pattern, we are just gonna be raising a needle on each side until a certain point. Our next step we are going to do is what we're gonna do instead of the heel that we go right to the marks before the hash, literally this needle right beside, what we're gonna do with the toe is we're actually gonna leave those there. We're gonna be on the second needle should be raised. So at that point when this second needle from the hash or before is up, then we're gonna do the other part of the toe. All right, so that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna work down until we're on the second from the mark. All right, so here we go. So we're at 12, we do what we do. Crank, 12, crank, there we are. Let's repeat on both sides until you get to your target. When your work starts to rise, then you can move your V-fork. Then you get paranoid, you can move your V-fork, whatever you wanna do. I raised that left one, so I don't need to do it. Here we go. There we go. Now there are a lot of methods of decreasing, increasing. This is the one I prefer to use as I find it super simple. All right, we're coming close to our target. All right, so we are done at our target on the right. We're on the second needle from the hash. I'm gonna crank, second needle from the hash, good. So now you can see that we are second needle from the hash. What we're gonna do now is we're gonna do the increase. This is different from the heel. We're doing a different pattern than the heel. So there we go. All right, so here we go. All right. So here's the different part of the toe than the heel. The first step is to lower a needle on both sides. Once we're doing something different. You don't have to follow this, but this is the pattern on this one. So using the no wrap method once again, where the previous yarn is under the latch, when I crank back, the yarn will feed in and it'll do on both sides, okay? That's just for this first step with doing the increase. Let's zoom out a bit so we can see what we're doing. All right, so both are there, all latches open. There we go, beautiful. I'm just gonna bring it up a bit more because I'm a little paranoid. All right, so we're on the left side. First thing we do, we're about 12, is we do our needle movement and crank. 12, needle movement. 
Make sure it stays open. Crank. 12 needle movement. Crank. 12 needle movement. Crank. You got it. Continue until we get to those half marks. So we are done knitting on the opposite side of the sock. We will not knit again unless we're using scrap. So that is why we worked one less row on the foot. Oh, that's such a beautiful yarn. All right, so not quite at the half mark yet. One before the left, one before the right. Now the one on the left, and we're gonna stop at six, okay? So all the marks on the left are now down. Stop at six. The needle before the hash on the right is up, do not worry, okay? Now we lower the back needles, put them back into work, make sure all the latches are open. Great, so now we're gonna stop at the needle just before the halfway part on the right. We're gonna stop just before three o'clock and then we're done our sock. Done our sock, where are you? Bada bing, bada boom. There, last needle before is down. There we go. Now we're gonna cut our yarn. I like to cut my yarn um, as it comes up and over and then slightly down off the yarn topper. That's where I cut it. If I cut it at the ball of um, yarn, then it will be too long and you're wasting, so don't waste if you can. All right, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna put the scrap on the machine because we need to make sure none of those stitches drop. So tying your sock yarn and your scrap on a knot that won't undo, because we have lots of extra fiber there. Take your heel spring off, don't need it. Make sure you thread your yarn, oops. Yeah, that works. Thread your yarn carrier. That's just this way of doing it. You could have just put the sock yarn in the middle and then laid the scrap to start on the first stitch. You'll see in a minute, here we go. What I'm doing here is because I started the scrap and the sock way by the ball, I don't have to rethread the top. So just another way of being lazy, which is awesome. I don't have to thread the topper again with a new yarn if I do it this way. I just feed it through. All right, so this extra amber colored yarn is gonna be what I make the Kitchener close the toe part with. There we are. Everything will be knitting. I'm just gonna hold it because that's what I do at this point. There we go. All the stitches, oh, that one's closed. Tricky. There you go. Beautiful. So often this is acrylic um, sock weight yarn, very inexpensive on eBay. What I like to do is just maybe like five or six rows and then I stop. And what I choose to do is I often choose maybe to put a little bit of cotton. Those rows I've done so far are probably more than enough to keep those stitches happy. But by putting a little bit extra if the sock is off the machine and you're like moving around, bringing it to work, to work on your lunchtime, less likely that you're gonna undo it if there's a little bit extra fiber not to un, to just kind of protect those live stitches. So this will make more sense in a minute. If I was to continue making the second sock, which I've already made the first one, so I wouldn't make a third, then I would make this long enough with the scrap that the sock and the heel or toe is beneath the machine so that when I add the buckle I don't have to worry about that weight needing to be there. So this here is extra fiber it needs to be beneath. Anyways so here we go. So this is just a cotton yarn that's catching Good enough, is it? Holy moly, that's the strong stuff. All right, so we'll just do this, bada bing. 
And then we're gonna take it off the machine. Take your weights off so you don't hit the floor. If you're in an apartment building, they really like you when you bang things heavy on the floor. Taking the weight off the machine. Unthread your carrier so you don't jam it when it knots. Just stick the extra inside. Hold your work gently. Pull down gently, slowly crank so that you're not bashing, clashing any latches. Okay, oh, the machine. All right. So that helped a little bit. There we go. So we now have two socks. Oh, wow, it looks great. Let me show you. We now have two socks. So here's the top where it's connected to the bonnet, cuff, leg, heel, foot, toe. Perfect. Thank you so much for joining me with this venture.